This is our last panel of the annual conference. Uh, we have a moderator in Jeff Summerhays, who is a member of the executive board of the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority and also a member of the IAIS Executive Committee, but also a moderator who can deal with adversity, as he had to deal with two unfortunate, though very understandable, uh, panelists who could no longer attend. But we're also very fortunate to have two very resilient panelists who thankfully represent the supervisory side, who are able to show that in the face of adversity and on short notice, they can come and bring their A game. So let me start from the far end. Uh, Mr. Peter Smith, who is the Managing Director of Strategy, Policy and Risk at the Dubai Financial Services Authority, followed by Mr. Hiroshi Ota, who is a Deputy Commissioner of International Affairs at the Japan Financial Services Authority, and until yesterday was also the Vice Chair of our Executive Committee. Then we have Mr. Bill Marku, who is a member of the board of Convex Insurance, followed by Claudia Donselman, who is the group head of regulatory and public affairs with Allianz. So with that, Jeff, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be with you for this last panel. And I want to start by just reflecting on the last couple of days, which have been a really terrific lineup, I think, and hopefully our last panel will complement that. So just reflecting on what we've heard in the last couple of days. Uh, supervision in the digital era uh, was the first one. Cyber resilience, first up today. Data and innovation. Uh, the panel just before the break. Uh, digital financial inclusion. And our focus for this fifth and last panel is the impact of technology on market structure and effective uh, approaches of supervision. And we have a lot of stuff to work with. There are some key things that, as a panel, we have thought about before um, commencing today was the effectiveness of supervision, approaches to fintech development, which we want to explore, uh, reliance on partners and third-party providers to insurance business models, and the importance of international and cross-sectoral uh, cooperation in this environment. But I want to start by having an industry perspective, and I'm going to firstly go to uh, Claudia and, uh, to give a big insurance uh, perspective from Allianz, and then I want to throw to Bill, who is at the other end of the spectrum with a, uh, a virtual insurance company in, in Convex, and uh, hear those perspectives. But uh, Claudia, you're, you're not only um, from a big insurance company, but insur an insurance company that is now thinking about being a software provider as well as uh, an underwriter. So perhaps set the context for us. Thank you very much, um, um, Jeff, uh, for having me and, and providing uh, actually industry perspective um, to a very important topic. So. Thank you. Um, so um, um, thank you for having me, um, Jeff, and um, thank you to all in the audience um, that you are still here. This is the last panel, so it's always challenging. Um, I, I said to Connor, I normally skip the last session, so I'm happy for everybody who's here. So industry <laughs> perspective on an important topic, um, which is um, supervision in the digital age. Before um, I dive into um, how digitalization actually changes um, um, the industry, I, I want to talk about briefly about what the drivers of change are. So, so why is the industry changing? And there are actually three points. Um, the first is what we see um, as Allianz, um, consumer preferences are changing. So consumers want to buy insurance um, via digital channels. Insurance co uh, customers want to be in ecosystems um, um, where they can um, buy insurance products together, maybe with other products or services that they are buying. Secondly, technological developments trigger new business lines in our companies. And they also trigger new entrants that are coming um, into the insurance value chain. Um, and that can be fintechs, insurtechs, big techs, all sorts of new entrants. And secondly, and this is something we rarely discuss, but I think this is important, 
there are some regulatory initiatives around the world that also trigger um, um, more changes um, in the insurance business. So, for example, um, those coming from Europe know there's a regulation that is called PSD2. It is about free flow of data from banks, mm. but this has also an impact on that we can use this data, so new kind of streams are coming into the value chain of the insurance company. So these are kind of the three drivers. So wh what happens with this now in the insurance company, so as kind of the outcome of the change we see? And there are again three things um, that I would highlight, and it is uh, imp uh, important to distinguish between um, these three. They come together, but it's important to look at them um, separately. The first is, so through many new entrants coming into the insurance value chain, the insurance value chain is vertically extremely unbundled. So that means we have more of modular pieces in a modern insurance value chain where in the past we only had one insurance company um, taking care of the entire value chain. So now you have a bundle of modular um, pieces in that value chain so you can say there's not one entity anymore that owns the value chain. Second is with digitalization, we go more and more into B2B2X partnerships, and that is what Jeff was just referring to, and a press release um, um, we have uh, given out yesterday, um, where Allianz said we are now partnering with Microsoft um, um, on digital insurance or insure tech, and actually this is about um, um, giving, well, certain and important parts of our insurance platform into a cloud hosted by Microsoft and then offering this platform as a service to other insurance companies. So we are going much more into these partnerships. And it is important to distinguish between the second point and the first, because the first is often seen as an attacker. It's often seen as competition coming through the new entrants, but it's important to understand that we also like to have these new entrants because they can add to the insurance value chain and they can add to the things that we are good in. And then the last thing is, um, this is not the fragmentation which we had first, but it's more with digitalization we go into business models that feed into the ecosystem requirements of the customer, which means we often go cross-border. So we as Allianz just set up a direct player and that direct player sells insurance services cross-border. And so we are currently dealing, and we come to that later, um, with many um, um, supervisors, and that is kind of the challenge we have in that value chain. So there are plenty of issues in there for supervisors, from what I've just heard. I mean, uh, before going to Bill, how much of a cultural challenge has that been for the organisation to uh, become a software provider? And, you know, not... I'm thinking here as a supervisor, that's that's a challenging thought. Um, but uh, you know, that is a that is a pretty big shift. Just yeah. briefly. Yeah. I mean, that's a big challenge in an organization. So the first challenge really with this is giving something up, and that is with the announcement you are referring to. So being a um, service provider is kind of you're giving up the things you owned on your own, and you're giving that to others. So that's a and this a is to other insurance companies. To other insurance companies. So you would be a. Uh, provide a platform to other insurers to use an Allianz platform in their markets? Is well, actually, it's it's with the partnership with Microsoft, right? right. So we are giving um, um, pieces of our insurance platform into the cloud hosted by Microsoft, and then other insurance companies can use this platform as a service. Right. So it's, it's not that we are the service provider, so we are working with Microsoft, and that is important, okay. actually. Um, but yeah, it's a cultural shift, so it's a mindset shift, and you all know that cultural change is the most difficult change, and it takes a lot of time, but it's also um, an educational um, challenge, yeah. because you need people with other mindsets and also people with other knowledge. So it, it's an entire change in the understanding of what insurance is. So I'm keen to get Hiroshi and Peter's reflection on what you've just said. <laughs> 
But before we go there, um, Bill, um, you're at the other end of the spectrum in terms of your firm that you're on the board of, um, which I think you describe as a virtual insurer, but I mightn't have that right. So unpack that for us. Certainly. Thank you. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here. And I must say, um, Jeff, as you noted, the conversation over yesterday and today has really set up, I think, a lot of the uh, issues that we'll, we'll um, dive into here today. Um, but I'm here speaking um, as a board member of Convex Insurance Company. I think, let me give you just a very brief uh, description of what Convex is, because it is a, it is a startup um, insurance company. It's a startup insurance company that raised $1.6 billion and launched uh, this year. So it has some financial resources behind it. Um, it is a Bermuda holding company with a Bermuda reinsurer, but the main operating insurance company is, is uh, based in London, um, regulated by the, uh, by the PRA. Um, Convex is uh, led by two industry veterans, Stephen Catlin and Paul Brand. Um, both were at Catlin, Cat Stephen being the founder there. So it's an, interesting, um, it's an interesting startup because it has substantial financial resources. It has substantial insurance veterans who know the industry. But maybe what's most exciting for them, and indeed relevant for today, is it starts its business with no legacy systems. And they understood that this was a huge opportunity to take a hold of what is, is available and the developments that have taken place with innovation um, uh, across the board. And they are a tech driven company. When they're not virtual, they do have an office building and they have staff and they're in, in place, but they are very much a tech driven company. That's both on the front end of underwriting risks, um, dealing with claims, understanding markets, but one aspect of it is, which is really gets us to what I think is part of what we want to talk about today, they've made a, um, a decision or they've created a structure where they are outsourcing all of their non-core insurance activities. Um, they, um, uh, it, they've done this um, not just because they thought that would be a fun way to go. It wasn't the strategy to begin with. It was a result of the strategy. And that strategy was really what Claudia sort of referenced uh, to. They want to do what they're really good at doing. And that's underwriting risks and understanding risks and pricing risk. And they want to buy the best people the best services in the market for the things that they're not really great at doing, which is back office processing, business processing, data entry, all of these very, very important parts of an insurance operation, but ones which they don't think they have differentiating skill sets for. And so they're outsourcing that with the goal, they hope, of obtaining much better service, um, eliminating process risk, doing things faster, less expensive, which is not irrelevant in, uh, in uh, this marketplace. Um, and so the, their hope is it really leads to much, more, uh, much better performance. They're mindful, however, and this begins to get to the regulatory issues, um, is that they are substituting um, that process risk, they're, 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 they're de-emphasizing, they're eliminating process risk, they think, but they're gaining counterparty risk because they are going to really rely and have a much, a great deal of reliance on the quality of the, um, of the outsourcing uh, service provider. And happy to talk later as we mm. go into of what they've done, because I think it does begin to get to the issues that will be on the minds of regulators as you, as you look at this operation. But that's what Convex has done, and it, is, it has started business, it started underwriting. Obviously, this renewal season is going to be the big season, but it's going to be an interesting story to watch sure. um, as, it, as it unfolds. Thank so you, Bill. Stuff yeah, thank you. So, Hiroshi, um, uh, process risk to counterparty risk. How do we how do we think about this as supervisors on the both Bill's example and uh, Cloudy's example in the context of our supervisory frameworks? Are they fit for purpose in this rapidly evolving world? Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, First, I have to start with the, uh, the usual disclaimer that uh, <laughs> what I say today is solely my personal view and does not represent the view of my institution, TFSA, just to be, to be clear. Maybe I can come back with the, uh, this uh, issue, interesting issue of outsourcing, but the, uh, first, I'd like to share with you uh, uh, what 
uh, we, GFSA, no, sorry, what I think about the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the impact of technology on market uh, structure. So when we talk about the impact of technology on market structure, what comes first to my mind is not a viability of incumbent insurers, sorry for those from the industry in the audience today, but rather how a new market structure can bring benefit to the customers through new technologies while adequately containing risks to policyholders and to the financial stability. And one year ago, as the, uh, the Buenos Aires summit last November, G20 leaders agreed to step up efforts to ensure that the potential benefits of technology in the financial sector can be realized while risks are mitigated. Good statement, no one would disagree, but then the question is how do we put this vision into practice? So every regulator faces the challenge of striking the right balance between promoting innovation while ensuring the public interest in areas like financial stability or consumer protection or anti-money laundering or counter uh, financing to terrorism. And uh, uh, historically, the simplest way to ensure the public interest was to set up regulation and implement it. That's what we did, the regulators. And then technological innovation poses challenges. What challenges? First, regulation could stifle innovation. And this could particularly happen if regulations are brought in to control every imaginable risks before the benefit of the new services are realized. And secondly, regulation may fail to keep pace with innovation. And recent technological developments make it possible to unbundle, like Claudia said, financial services, while, uh, which were previously solely in the hands of financial institutions, which provide full line services. And then IT companies came. And this could now offer consumers with a specific line of service, like peer-to-peer -peer small amount insurance, for example. And in some cases, they can re-bundle financial and non-financial services to better meet the customer's needs. And so in contrast to such development, financial regulations are imposed largely on an entity-based approach. And this could mean that the practical same financial activities could face different regulatory treatment depending on who conducts such activities and which law regulates those activities. Doesn't this situation stifle a level playing field? Doesn't this situation overlook firms exploiting regulatory loopholes? That's our concern. We probably need to explore activity-based or function-based financial regulations, which also should be cross-sectoral. That's a big challenge for every financial regulator. Mm. Maybe I stop here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So you've unpacked activity-based supervision, which is, uh, is, is, is where I think um, we should explore further. But Peter, uh, c what can you add to that? Uh, to, to those perspectives? I, I, I think in terms of uh, how technology is affecting the structure of the market that we, we need to regulate, um, I think we see um, several trends. Some of those trends are facilitated by technology. Some of those trends are only possible because of technology. Lots, lots of technology, obviously. I'm not going to repeat uh, what's been said over the last day and a half about the potential benefits of technology. I think we, we all recognize there are significant potential benefits to the industry, uh, to policyholders, to the wider community from, from the effective use of technology. What I would note is that in this particular region, uh, millennials are the largest age group and the least insured, just as a flag for anyone who wants to come into business in the region. Um, the, the, but there is uh, a significant 
shift in how people expect to deal with financial service providers, as Claudia has already noted. Um, we, we, we see two trends that are relevant for market structure. On the one hand, we do see new entrants to the market looking at very specific and often very, very small pieces of the overall value chain. This is in the Gulf region? In the Gulf region, yeah, and, and more broadly, but in the Gulf region. And, and, and so we do see a, a fragmentation of service provision. That doesn't necessarily lead to a fragmentation of regulatory responsibility, but we certainly see a fragmentation of service provision. Um, and on the other hand, we see that uh, uh, there's an increase perhaps in some aspects of concentration risk because lots of people are using the same providers, whether they be cloud providers or whether they be the uh, whether they be a, a situation where everyone, for example, is using the same blockchain provider for, for claims processing or things of that sort. But we, we see uh, a change in, in concentration risk, a change in potential uh, critical points of failure within the system. So those are the real, yeah. the real structural things we see. I think the other thing that's worth noting is that, that the large majority of the new entrants we see uh, are not like Bill's firm. They are firms that are actually technology providers to existing financial services players. That's what we've seen so far. Um, and, and, and because of that, our engagement with them is, is necessarily different than it would be with a firm that actually needs to be licensed by us and, and regulated and supervised on an ongoing basis. Um, but I think one very important point that I, I would stress for all supervisors is that doesn't mean you can ignore them just because you don't need to regulate them. So, so Bill, reflecting on both Peter and and Hiroshi's comments, I mean, you, your background is as a lawyer and you have been in and around the IAS for many years and, uh, and a, both a commentator and a supporter on, a, on its activities. Uh, Hiroshi touched on activity-based supervision and in the context of you know, where the association is and where the market is developing, what would be your reflections on, on the, you know, the fit for purpose of our, our current frameworks? Well, I think it's, a, it's an area that needs um, a lot of conversation and discussion around it. And today's um, you know, part of that discussion is an important part of it, and it's to the IAS's credit that it's, it's putting this out up front there. Um, it is, I guess I would frame it this way. There are new activities in the marketplace. There are new players doing new things, and so there's, there, there is new activity that the regulatory environment needs to react to. Um, but in my mind, I'm not sure that leads to activities-based right. regulation, um, because I think that might be, well, then you as a cloud service provider are doing something so that's of interest to us as insurance supervisors, so we're going to try to regulate you, the cloud service provider. So, so can I challenge you on that? Yeah. Uh, how does your regulator, how do you make your regulator comfortable with your swapping process risk for counterparty risk. So, what what assurances are you have? Uh, yeah, what, tell us about that conversation yep. with this model. I'm, I'm, uh, um, I, I will do that because I, I think the supervisor can still concentrate his regulatory attention on the insurance entity. Um, it could be an intermediary, um, but let's use a carrier at this point. But it's rethinking, and I think the important thing for the regulators here is they need to be aware of what's happening. They need, how, they need to know how to look at the entity they do regulate, insurance carrier, and then understand what are they doing, as you say, if they're outsourcing a lot of information. But it's using really the indirect power, I think, and, and I think there are a number of existing regulatory tools that they have. Insurance regulators require you know, risk management, mm -hmm. They require that you have good systems in place. They require that you have good governance in place. And I think it's using those where there needs to be, the regulator sh should ask the questions. I can tell you what Convex did. I think it's what insurers should do that are making big moves in this space. Talk to the regulators. 
up front, not waiting for a sense that is there a problem, but explain what you're doing, what safeguards you're taking, and indeed convex, I think, it's, um, it is a, um, this, this risk factor is a huge topic of conversation. Sure. It's a co topic of conversation in the board, in the senior management uh, team, um, and down through that. And they did, both in terms of the due diligence they did before choosing their service provider, very um, intensive contractual uh, provisions that have service levels, have weekly, monthly monitoring, have escalation clauses, actually has a governance for the relationship with the service provider. And so I think it's where regulators, if they increase their knowledge, and I think this is, this is a, it's a learning process for everybody in the, in the system, but they need to become more sophisticated about what is happening, how it's happening, where the risks are, but then probably using to better advantage sure. pre-existing regulatory authority, but in a different way. That's the, in, that's the innovation on the regulatory side, I think, as opposed to um, we have to reach out and, and, and give a bear hug to a greater part of the global economy and say, yeah. we're going we're gonna to govern this as well. But that's, that's some thoughts. So, Hiroshi, if uh, Convex was, and I don't know whether you are or you aren't, but operating in the Japanese market, I mean, how would you, how would you approach the regulation of that, of the business model that Bill has described? Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, I don't say that the current entity-based regulation, entity-based approach should be replaced by activity-based approach. Still, you know, insurers uh, are licensed uh, business, mm -hmm. and the, uh, we need to, to, to uh, uh, supervise those uh, licensed entities. And the, uh, to do that, we need entity-based uh, regulation and supervision. Mm -hmm. But what I was going to say uh, is that since now the uh, that whole value chain of uh, insurance business can be uh, 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 unbundled, hmm. uh, maybe we can add as a new uh, perspective a sort of the uh, 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 activity-based approach mm -hmm. and the, uh, so that uh, we can adequately concentrate on where uh, our supervision really, really is needed. So I think uh, to use the, uh, the best of my uh, uh, supervisory resources and also to uh, better protect the uh, 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 consumers, I, need, I think we need to you know, uh, uh, cleverly use both entity-based supervision and also the activity-based supervision. I don't know exactly how we can do that, we are just starting to, to explore uh, uh, this uh, new uh, approach, but the, uh, I think that is yeah, a way forward that we are doing. Peter, anything to add on, on that? I think um, uh, just a, a couple of things. I mean, we, we, we license legal entities to perform activities. Um, we, we've sort of not, never really separated the two. Um, in, in, in one sense, and um, and like most regulators, we, we like to look for somebody who's um, legally responsible for the things that are going on. And I, 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 I can't see yet what a model where that isn't the insurer yeah. would look like, so I think I agree with Bill's, Bill's point on that. I, I think the other thing is, is that um, outsourcing uh, uh, third-party service provision is, isn't new. Yes, it, it's it's been a, a long-run trend, really, in in the insurance sector and in, and in other other sectors. And so, su supervision of, of those aspects of, of business is 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 not new. I think it's taking on an increasing importance uh, over the last few years, and will continue to become uh, ever more important. And and I think that leads to. Um, the, the licensed insurer having to be very, very careful about the partners that they do select, and because they're the ones that we're going to look to first, at least in, under the current model, when something goes wrong. We're, we're not going to 
point the finger first at the cloud provider if data goes missing. We're going to say to the licensed insurer, why did you use that cloud provider? <laughs> so um, I, I think um, the, the, other, the other thing that I think is, is, is an interesting question here is w when we look at corporate governance of, 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 a, of a licensed insurer, we, we don't look at corporate governance necessarily in relation to specific activities. I mean, you can get there, but we tend to start off by looking at corporate governance for the, for the, for the, the firm or the, or the group as a, as a, as a whole. And, and I think there are some things that you do need to look at on, a, on an, an entity or, or a group a group basis. That, having said that, I'm going to circle back around now and just finish by saying that some of the newer activities that, that are being fragmented away from the value chain or fragmented within the value chain, as I said in my initial remarks, I do think we do need to think carefully um, about whether we end up with the right people being regulated for the right things. I'm not advocating there that insurance supervisors or indeed financial sector supervisors should start immediately regulating a whole swathe of, of new players. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we need to think carefully about whether the existing model that we do have that focuses on firms actually enables us to get at the risks in the right way. So I'm not hearing um, any proposals for radical change, but I want to, Claudia, I wonder how that's working for you as a global insurer um, in an increasingly fragmented business model, and you reference now cross-border distribution. There must be some rub in there for uh, you know, regulatory friction across, uh, uh, across different, different jurisdictions. Is, is, that, is, that a, is that a challenge or, or not? Well, yeah, I, I would like to bring into this discussion um, um, one more point. So the discussion, at, at least from our side, is not about what type of supervision is possible. So is it entity-based or do we need to move to activity-based? I personally think it will be somewhere in the middle, uh, meaning having a matrix um, 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 kind of, of model, and it's important when you define the scope, I think, what entities and activities are in the scope, but I agree with Peter, it's always the legal entity that will mm. be supervised. So, but the question that, that exists is, it's not about what is possible, but what is effective. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, seeing that the insurance value chain is more fragmented, so is it still effective that only the insurance company, so the, insurance, the core insurance insurance company that bears or the risk at the end of the day is the one that is kind of responding to supervision. Is that effective? And I think this is what we want to achieve, So what right? is the answer to that question? Well, it, it's not, I, I would say, because right. there are some activities where we are not close enough anymore. Let's look into B2B2C business and how close are we to knowing our customer and customer needs if we don't have the direct interface. Mm. So these are points where we need to look into from a perspective of effectiveness. So how does supervision work? Then with regard to the cross-border business we talked about, indeed this is something where we look at from an efficiency point of view, and this is getting more and more difficult. So if we roll out a global platform, and we just started with our Allianz Direct business, we start in a few countries, but it's crystal clear from the business plan that Allianz Direct is a cross country um, a business with many countries. So how efficient is that if I still need to deal with supervisory authorities in all these countries? Or would there be room for a model that has more of a subsidiarity idea? So meaning the home supervisor of where the carrier sits. Mm. So this Allianz Direct is kind of the main supervisor, or let's call it, we already have the language, the group supervisor for that platform and has a special role. And that, that is not defined yet. So that means when we are now rolling out, we are talking to many, many um, supervisors. And it's not about that we find it too difficult and time consuming. It's about, is it effective? So. Is a golden opportunity here. You've got a room full of regulators. Uh, here's, here's your opportunity to articulate how it should change. So um, do you, you have said it is not as effective or as efficient, at, you know, as, as, as perhaps is optimal. 
Are there particular areas which you would say that we as regulators should focus on to improve that market efficiency? Well, yeah, I think the basis uh, for such a model is already in place, at least, I mean, in Europe, with the implementation of Solvency um, II, we have the group supervisor with right. special roles. So it's probably more of a uh, further development of that model of okay. the group supervision. And we say, what does group supervision mean in times of digital platforms? And how can we further strengthen or you uh, further strengthen the role of the group supervisor in this cross-border business? And with digital platforms, is that a different paradigm to traditional platforms in terms of group supervision? Yeah, I would say so. So the basis is there because currently the group supervisor is kind, is kind of orchestrating the college of supervisors, right? But the question is, are there more powers when we come to business that mm. doesn't stay in the boundaries of one country but that goes cross-country? Mm. You know, what I think that last point there is is, is the important one and the and the tension that can arise because unlike some group activities where solvency regulation at the group level, you can you can understand the group-wide supervisor having that authority. But here, if you're indeed take outsourcing or using technology in some form and it's a company that has multiple subsidiaries in multiple countries, getting back to the activity, the insurance supervisor in each one of those countries would rightly look at what's my insurer doing. And if it's part of this group outsourcing mm -hmm. mechanism, because that's the way the group has, has structured itself, that local supervisor will rightly say, well, wait a minute, I want to have rules hmm. related to that part that relates to policyholders in my country and the, and the subsidiary or the branch that is in my jurisdiction. And I think it's there that there is this potential, because things are moving so quickly, that if countries do different things to answer that question, you're going to wind up with, with regulation thwarting a move towards more efficient um, ways forward. Now, you, because you're mm -hmm. provocative, you're going to say, okay, so how do you prevent that, right? I can anticipate the question, but mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult because it's, it's, but the goal, I think, is clear. You want as much harmonization and coordination as possible in this area so that you don't have the, the drag, you don't have the impediments of rolling out technological plays that, that could benefit, you know, all the operating entities within within a group. But I think those are, I mean, that's, you're, that's getting into the very, very tough questions. And I think, um, you know, further discussion of what the, some of the solutions would be mm -hmm. then have to go to, you know, what can we do to, to, to make some harmonization? Yeah, sure. So how about we go to you, to the audience, and uh, so open up your Menti app and let's do the, ask your reflections on this, this challenge about um, the regulatory framework and uh, we should have the first question up there which is, um, is your current regulatory framework sufficient to ensure adequate oversight uh, of the possible risks from, from, from outsourcing or, or diff different business models? Um, Difficult to read uh, there. Yes is A, no, but we have a plan in place to bridge the gap over the next year, or no, um, um, you know, full stop. <laughs> I see the code has changed from the earlier yeah, session, so. Nice. Four nine four seven four seven. Ah. Numbers are building. So, Bill, what do you what do you think about that in the context of of what what the comments you just made? They listened carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm I'm surprised, um, but I think there I think it may be the right answer. I, again, I think there are the there are tools that are in place. They have to be used uh, uh, yeah. in an innovative way, and it 
and so and, it's a reinterpretation of, of of the, the power, powers and tools yep. as opposed to a new set of tools. Yep. Yeah, I I, yeah. I think there's obviously I think there's some areas where indeed yeah. some new things, but I think overall that um, um, I would agree with the with the polling. Um, Hiroshi. Okay. Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, we have a fair amount of the answers who say no other, including adopting a uh, wait and see approach. I think maybe uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, the outsourcing issue, uh, maybe we can think about two things. One is uh, whether we have a sufficient regulatory framework for that. And whether we have sufficient resources to implement the, uh, the supervision. And my sense is that the, uh, uh, many countries do have uh, a framework, but also many countries do not have sufficient resources, including my own country. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, that's gonna be a challenge for, for supervisors in coming years. But with regard to the, uh, the framework, I would like to add that the uh, 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 the newly revised ICPs and the, uh, the adapted COM frame provides a very good uh, base uh, for the uh, international supervisor cooperation. So I think the, uh, 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 with the, uh, the new uh, ICPs and COM frame, I think the, uh, the f at least the f regulatory framework can be enhanced in coming years. Hmm. So Peter, um, picking up on that, uh, cooperation, uh, capacity building within supervisors, um, cross-jurisdictional um, cooperation internationally. You know, how, how, do you, you know, how do you think about it in the, in the Gulf region, which is well, a relatively new um, you know, insurance market growing rapidly? How have you, how have you built those capabilities I, I, and, and are you building a, a new model um, I, that, that, that I, leapfrogs? I think, I think we're, I think we're um, a bit like the answers to the question so we're a bit reliant on on existing structures, and there's, uh, there are some new things happening. Uh, but but for for us in in, in Dubai, we, we supervise an international financial centre. The sort of implication of that is that uh, most of the firms we supervise, and certainly nearly all of the insurers that we we supervise, are from somewhere else. Mm. So in, international cooperation is an absolute key to us being able to do our our job and being a signatory to the IAS MMOU, for example. Is, is 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 an absolute boon in, in enabling us to do our to do our, our, our job well. So so international cooperation has always been sort of part of the DNA of what of, of what we do. Um, but it's becoming increasingly important even in that environment because we see that um, the 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 challenges that we face from the fact that somebody can have a business based on a, a, a if I'm old-fashioned enough to say a PC in their bedroom. Um, if people still use PCs, I suppose. But, um, you know, but somebody can have a, a business that can reach globally from a computer in their bedroom, and, and, and the regulatory world, as, as Claudia and Bill have mentioned, is, is, is simply not structured to deal with that global reach um, without a lot of um, impact on the, the person who set up that, 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 that business. So um, I think... Uh, you know, we, we cooperate with it within the UAE. We, we work with the insurance authority and we work with our uh, colleagues in the ADGM on, on insurance matters when we need to. We, within the, the, the wider region, um, the, uh, the Arab for, Forum of Insurance Regulatory Commissions has now been relaunched re, re, re as the Arab Union of Insurance Regulatory Commissions as, in, as one of the, the sort of regional groups. And, 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 and I think that, you know, cooperation uh, is... is there are vehicles for cooperation in, in, in the sort of traditional manner, but we're also on the technology front, we're, we're part of what's called the Global Financial Innovation Network, um, which, which is not a standard setting body and has no aspirations to be a standard setting body. It's just a group of, of, of supervisors globally who are interested in innovation and who are interested in trying to um, deal with the fact that if you've got a startup firm with a great idea that wants to do things in many countries, for that firm having to fill in 17 different application forms to work in 17 countries might, might be an insuperable obstacle to them ever getting their idea off the ground. So it's, it's about trying to think about whether there are better ways 
for, for us to supervise at a practical level and, and to and to facilitate the development of innovation. As I say, it's not about standard setting mm. because there are the IAS and, and other bodies are, are in a place to, to set standards yeah. anyway. But it, it is about the, the, the practical day-to-day -day issues that technology throws up in, in terms of small firms, for example, with, with, with good ideas wanting to do new things sure. and, and how we can facilitate that. I, I mean, I know at this particular conference there has been a big effort put into uh, capability building sessions, the lunch and learns, which have been run over the last couple of days. Um, uh, f and for the regulators in the room, they've been very well attended. Uh, for, um, for the industry participants, I, I know you weren't part of those sessions, no doubt had productive discussions outside of that, but uh, that is something new for us as an association, and it is, um, it's something we're very focused on, the need to to build capacity within our supervisory uh, community. Uh, Claudia, you know, as a global firm going across jurisdictions, you know, do you see variability in, in on the, these issues? You must, um, from, uh, you know, country to country. And, and, and how do you, you know, how do you work with supervisors on, on those issues? Well, there's different, uh, definitely variety, right? I mean, I, I would say that the situation already improved since the implementation of colleges. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really must see, I mean, we are kind of, of bundling or we have a key account management for supervisory interactions mm -hmm. in order to kind of, of um, best uh, collaborate. Be, uh, why is that? Because I truly believe that, that good supervision is a shared effort. Mm -hmm. So good supervision means that we listen to supervisors and the other way around. So we have bundled that. And, and what I see now working together very closely with the group supervisor and then giving them feedback what works and what does not work, and they having the ability to discuss those is issues in the college that already approved a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, there are different um, maturity stage, and we kind of need to deal with it. But what we appreciate um, is really the strong role of the group supervisor. So that already helped a lot. But I agree, it's probably always something um, where more effort is needed. But for us, what is already very, very helpful is having this one touch point for the group. Yeah. I, I want to go to another question, actually, for those um, at the control desk at the back, I'd like to jump over question two and ask question three, which touches on, on this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. So polling question three, um, I don't know whether it's possible to skip question two, but uh, 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 tell me if it's not. But um, uh, It's not. No, it's not. Okay, well, why don't we do question two then to start with? So, um, and then we, we, can, um, we can go. Ah, oh, here so. it is. <laughs> okay, so we have got it. Um, Okay, so in an increasingly digital era, era, what do you think are the most effective supervised responses? Um, that is question two, yes. Mm -hmm. This is picking up some on the points around activity-based and um, increase focus on operational resilience. Um, group supervision. Well, that's a, um, that's a strong response. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to ask you to comment on this, Hiroshi, because this is, um, I wasn't sure whether that's what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> so as I read that, um, supervision vision will need to shift from an entity-based approach to an activity-based approach, um, which will require expanding the regulatory perimeter. Is that a rebuttal of, uh, of your wise words, or yeah. am I misinterpreting that? Yeah, I, I, 
Today I'm glad that the, uh, my concern is widely maybe shared with the, the, the audience. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, since, as I said, I don't have clear answer for that, and the, uh, uh, I'm still, why my institution is still in early stages of uh, developing the uh, activity-based uh, approach. Uh, we well, it's like not an either-or, is it? It's, a, 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 Sorry? it's not an either-or, is it? It's a, a you, there's no reason why you can't do both. Is that is that true? I mean, it's an extension of, of what uh, yeah what exactly entity base yes, yes 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 it's not a replacement yeah. it's an extension yeah. So Jeff, I might um, just take the opportunity to lobby for uh, C, which was um, supervision focused on operational resilience because I, I actually think um, that's you know that's the core of this for the insurer and of course that encompasses you know many aspects of how people are using technology, but obviously sure. one issue is what if it fails? What are your backup plans? Or are your policyholders and your finances and everything else going to collapse in a heap because you're a service provider? But, and there's a lot of issues that, that relate around that. And I guess, again, in my mind, it would bring us back to you know, that's where the insurance supervisor dealing with the insurance entity, um, looking at new activities of that entity, but not trying to regulate the entity as much as understanding the impact of those activities on the integrity and the operational resilience of, of, of hmm. the carrier. Um, How about the Expanding regulatory parameter, uh, uh, perimeters are uh, it's yeah. an alarming thought on a Friday. How afternoon. about the concentration risk of partners that firms that firms are dealing with? You know, ha how, how should we think about those issues? So, Well, I might... I, Claudia, because you guys, you know, use more. I mean, I think ultimately, from my vision on this, ultimately that could become an issue and somebody ought to have an eye on it. I think there's enough providers right now. Yeah. We're way short of that. But, Claudia, you'll have better knowledge, I think. Well, definitely. I mean, we see that, right? I mean, there are big um, um, cloud service providers and, and many of the companies are going there. So is there a concentration risk? Um, definitely. But there are also benefits of going there, right? Mm -hmm. So already years ago, we discussed in our company um, um, this question of who's better in kind of securing our data. Yeah. Is it us as an insurance company or is it someone um, um, who has that as the core business? So that is the question that needs to be answered. But then there are a few big ones and there is a concentration risk. When it then comes to supervision, the question is what is really the best approach? When we take the current system, that would mean that each insurance company outsourcing to that service provider would kind of need to ensure that they are properly dealing with that. And I had an interesting discussion that, um, just a couple of days ago um, with, with a colleague from a big four company and, and how they are doing it in their external audits. So they have approaches um, where they are working together with the external auditor of the service, the cloud service provider, to get an independent report and kind of base some of their assessments on this independent report. So the question is, yes, there will be um, concentration risk, but on the other side, these are the guys who professionally secure job. our data. So it, it's not bad only. There are also opportunities. The question is, how do we leverage their security net um, in order to be sure um, that, that we fulfill the, the um, supervisory requirements we have? So again, there's a capability and cultural issue within yes. firms and within supervisors yes. of understanding all of that. Yeah, and here comes this, this connotation of activity. I think we need to shift um, our mindset into that we have a variety of activities and not all of these activities are sitting in the regulated parameter. So some of them are sitting outside and we need to have a discussion how we get our arms around it. So mm. we as an industry, but probably also you as, as supervisors, and then having a, a definition of what is in scope and out of scope with regard to supervision. And there you have activities, but I agree um, w with Bill, you will also always have entities. So that's kind of this play. It's, it's more about defining the scope and not what is the object of supervision. Mm. Good. Um, the regulators at the at the end. I think, um, I think uh, Bill's point about operational resilience is important. I mean, it was the, the cyber session this morning, but 
essentially operational resilience is, is, is sort of the, 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 the new normal um, and in terms of what supervisors are going to be expecting of regulated firms, the, the skill set of um, preventing, obviously, but um, responding to, recovering from, and learning from operational incidents, whether it be cyber incidents or other incidents, is, is, is now a core skill set for mm -hmm. any, any financial institution. Um, and, and that's, again, only increasingly going to be the case going forward. Concentration risk points are an interesting one. Mm. You know, in, in some markets, particularly in, in some smaller or developing markets, there may only be one cloud provider. Um, and, and, if, and if the jurisdiction, if the country in question also has, has a policy of data localization where data has to be held within the, bo the, the, the borders of the country, um, even in the cloud borders, um, then, then you've immediately got a concentration issue. Um, I, I think it doesn't necessarily follow from that that we will end up regulating cloud service providers. Mm -hmm. I don't, just don't think it does. I, I think with all these technology questions, you know, the, the, the sort of a, I guess, a three-point plan for supervisors, you know, we've got to engage with it. But we can't ignore these developments. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to think about what they mean in terms of risk uh, and in, in terms of the challenges that they pose. Is, is it uh, a risk that we're familiar with, just in, perhaps in a slightly different guise? Or is it genuinely new risk, and if it is new risk? And then the third thing is we obviously need to act. But, sure. but you know, we, we, we see a lot of people starting to engage with, with, with some technology providers with some fintech firms, with insurtech firms, and, and so on. Um, and, and this is where the capacity building need is, is really important. We, we've tried to upskill our organization. We've created within our supervision area a separate team for operational risk, including cyber risk. We've brought in some expertise, and we're using those people who are experts to try and upskill our own people. But as Hiroshi said, we, we still don't have the resource for... Yeah for what we need to do, and I'm, I'm sure lots of other colleagues in the room are in exactly the same position. Well, well that's, that's a nice lead into our, our last audience our polling question, question three. What do you see is the most important role for the IAS in this area of supervisory approaches to technology developments? And then after I get your responses to that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll open the floor to some audience questions. platform for exchange of supervisory practices. I think that's what we've been doing in the last couple of days, so that is good. <laughs> I wonder whether developing guidance, mod uh, monitoring signaling trends is, is not rating highly because there's a thought that maybe this is, you know, that regulators are not the area of expertise there. So, um, but that's. Well, it's um, every, all of them apart from the last one, probably. Yeah. Well, it, it, it says that more regulation doesn't do the trick, right? Yes. And I would agree. I mean, it, it's not about do we need more regulation? And I, I would never say that. Spoken like a true industry participant. Uh, well, well, yeah, but, but, but really, <laughs> yes, but I, I think it's adapting yeah. to the new world. So the business model in our companies has evolved. True. So how is then supervision following? And, and that, for me, is crystal clear an explanation for this. So no, more. I, very clear. Very clear. You know, Jeff, uh, on, the, on the regulatory and, and sort of new laws and areas, you know, given this panel is really about technology in, in broad sources. We've been focusing heavily on outsourcing, which is one part of it. But obviously, technology is, is given both traditional insurance carriers, but a lot of non-traditional players in the space, yeah. the ability to, to do a lot of other things and new things. And I do believe that's an area where, indeed, new laws and regulations yeah, sure. need to be thought about, such as who's defined as an insurance intermediary. I mean, we've seen this in a lot of areas where a phone operator may be the, the conduit through which policies are sold, and, and the question is, do they need an intermediary license and others? So I do think in the broader topic of technology, um, this is where we need to look at, um, you know, 
it goes way back. Remember, we had electronic signatures. Yeah. Many laws said you had to have a, a and, wet and, signature on a policy. And we haven't really touched on conduct issues, but, but that has been the subject of other panels today. But th yeah. that, that is a big issue in this in this area. Yeah. So I think there's areas where indeed the laws and regulations have to resolve but, or, or evolve. But in the in this area of outsourcing, which is hugely important. It, it continue to argue that it's an ad adaptation of the tools in the toolkit, not trying to put more tools in the, in the toolkit. So I'm keen to get some um, some audience responses before we, we close out. Um, there's some microphones uh, in the room. I've got one at the front, uh, Yoshi, um, and one to the, why don't we go to the left? Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Marissa, and I'm from AWS, so I'm going to feel the pressure because I, 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 I know I'm the only CSP here. So, uh, so AWS is Amazon Web Services. Great. Right. We're well, a cloud provider. <laughs> yes, um, so perhaps a bit less of a question and more of a reflection, even sure. everything that's been talked throughout the last two days, a lot of mention of cloud. Uh, so I kind of feel the obligation that I need to say something. Uh, but picking up on perhaps what Peter was saying around you know, we, and I come from the banking sector, right, uh, where outsourcing has been going on for years. Mm -hmm. And Peter was saying, you know, perhaps these are slightly different guys and girls. Uh, so perhaps we are a little bit different. Uh, but certainly I, I don't think we are introducing new risks. In fact, the risk profile has changed, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, and I think there, and I would put the ball back to you, regulators, is you need to engage with us as well. We're here, we want to talk. You need resources? How should we do that better? Well, that's, I, I just was wondering why is it that there's no service provider, for example, throughout the last Very few good days. question. <laughs> uh, Connor, you have worked uh, many years ago. Um, well, it's good that but, you're here, though. And, exactly. uh, but the, I think, um, and you know, and taking it to, to us, I think we are also learning the rules of the regulated world. And we are absolutely conscious we need to play by those rules. Mm. Uh, but we need to engage in, in, in this dialogue. And you know, I would encourage you that for Santiago, you know, next year I'm going to be in a panel, or one of my colleagues will be in a panel, talking about how we, how we help you understand that this is perhaps a new, not new type, but a different type of risk. But it's been going on, and, and we need to work around how this change. And what are the, for example, what are the questions that supervisor needs to ask? Right when you are assessing um, this type of different mm -hmm. risk. Um, so, you know, the ball is back to you. Yep. Uh, we want to engage, we are, we are ready to engage. We have resources. Uh, we are absolutely conscious that the, of the upskilling issue, uh, but we need to establish those, um, those channels of communication that perhaps we don't have like, you know, the, the big insurance companies, the insurance companies already have with, with you regulators. We don't have that. So what is it that we can do together to address that? Well, we should absolutely pick that up. And, mm -hmm. and that is, thank you for your question and thank you for your intervention and the offer which we will, which we will follow up on. Thank you. Hey, Yoshi. Yes. Just activity-based supervision. Just having heard what you have said and seeing like Bill's company or Alliance, you know, um, so Bill's company, I understand, depends very much outsourced companies, and Alliance now provides service, right, to, to other companies. And, but just to please comment on my understanding is correct. So activity-based are still based on entity-based supervision, as Peter and uh, you know, Hiroshi mentioned. But also there's a huge activities, very much dependent on outside of uh, entity, right? So, my understanding is those outsourced companies, like some auditing company already oversee, so insurance regulators have gradually have a responsibility to oversee all those outsourced companies. And my question is, if it is outside of your own jurisdiction, and what's the sort of, you know, of power that the regulators can uh, entertain to oversee those uh, companies? So how does it work? Anyway, in the long run, I see that outsourced uh, service company have to be overseen if we follow this activity-based supervision. Is it correct or not? And if it is correct, how it should be done? Who wants to tackle that, Bill? Uh, I'll take an initial response. Um, working backwards, I think you're right. If you go down the activities-based road, you're going to wind up 
way, way down a road that I think is going to be difficult, which is, to answer your second question, you don't have, the, you're not going to have at least the easy jurisdiction over these service providers that are not acting and conducting the business of insurance, which triggers insurance regulation. They're, they're doing other things. Um, it'd be like saying the gas station that fills the car up for the CEO is, you know, a service provider, and if it's not, and you got to regulate the gas station. I know that's an absurd extension to it, but it's, it's. I think that's why I come back to the issue that you un, you have to understand what that activity is. You have to understand the you as the regulator have to understand what the activity is. You have to understand the risks, and then you have to know how to engage with the insurance entity, and say, here's what we're concerned about. What are you concerned about? What have you done to address this risk? Because we want to know that you've got operational resilience. Um, you know, in some ways, it falls under mm. you know business continuity so, uh, requirements, and so it's it's uh, Yoshi. This is probably the big difference: is it's not seeking to actually directly regulate that new activity. It's a new form of regulation, a new lens, probably to look at, at those new activities and its impact on the insurance carrier, which you very much do have mm. jurisdiction over. But Bill, in your model, you can outsource the activity, but you can't outsource the accountability and the responsibility. Correct. Exactly. And that's and, and and that's you know the that's the first biggest hook that is there. Mm -hmm. That it, absolutely the insurance executives, the board of directors, has a duty yeah. to make sure that the company is run responsibly. And if not, regulators have capital so, charges. So whether whether yeah. your employees are doing it or your partners are doing it, you are still accountable for it. But the the question still remains: is how does the supervisor get get comfortable that? that it's been done appropriately. So Yeah, that's and I think that's the capacity building and I do think the the uh, the intervention concerning, you know, it's 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 engaging. I think the industry does have an obligation and, and Claudia has, has said this very properly as well. Convex is of this view. When you're going into these new areas, engage your regulator, help them understand what is going on, answer questions. But of course then it's going to get the regulators are going to want to have their own source of knowledge mm -hmm. and there is a learning curve here and I think this is what mm -hmm. you know uh, Peter and, and um, Hiroshi has been saying as well even you know very heavily resourced jurisdictions like Japan which which certainly knows something about technology um, and regulation but is still mm -hmm. dealing with this so it's the core one of the core messages here is this is moving quickly and it is significant and it's technical but the real imports got to be, Try to get ahead of the curve, or at least not too far behind the curve, because you know what you don't know um, can be dreadful. Hmm. Sure. Um, maybe but, if I yeah. if I can add, yeah, um, 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 you Bill said um, the insurance company must be accountable, and by the way, we want to be accountable. Hmm. Yeah. Because there's huge risk in a situation where it doesn't work anymore, right? Hmm. There's huge risk of well, yeah. um, 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 business um, uh, interruption, but even more reputational risk. So there is an inherent risk that we get it right. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you, Bill. We need to understand really who is doing what. So what is um, the outsourcing company doing? What services? How do we as the insurance company look at it? And then I think US supervisors need to decide what piece of confirmation that the system is is going is coming from whom and and that should involve indeed the service providers thank you um, yes um, microphone is middle of the room thank you. Uh, good afternoon I'm Morek Fulalov with the Fulalov Consulting Group um, I have heard some discussion about in a sense, licensing or approval uh, artificial intelligence models. And I, I think it's uh, partly because of the difficulty of approving and assessing them. So is, uh, does it make sense to you all that there might be a time in which if you as a, your, say, Allianz's mm -hmm. group supervisor verified that the models had the correct governance and lack of bias and other things that, that then other um, in other parts of the world, those supervisors could rely on your assessment of the model and vice versa. And can you see that as a way of sort of an extension of the activity-based, but a little bit like licensing hell, I think. 
I mean, I'll have a quick go. And my response from our own agency, APRA in Australia, is that we do not have the capability to do that. So we, that's not to say we wouldn't do, we wouldn't engage somebody to provide certification of that, that we, that we could rely on. But it, it is not something that currently exists within our agency to, to verify such models, albeit that those um, AI and data analytics processes are now rapidly expanding in the organisations that we supervise. So, you know, it is an area of exposure and it is a gap and it, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is something where I think it's a challenge for, for supervisors uh, coming from, our, from the backgrounds that we do. But uh, happy to... Peter, uh, Yoshi? Yeah, I mean, in, in other areas, we have uh, taken comfort from the fact that another supervisor has already looked at let's say, a, gr a group's model, whether, whether that be in insurance or, or, in, or in banking or, or indeed in some securities business. Um, but most of those models don't suffer from some of the same challenges that AI does in terms of explainability and, and some of the ethical issues that are, that are being widely discussed at the, at the moment. So I, um, I, I think in, in principle, um, subject, as Jeff said, to sort of ha ha having the capacity to place some reliance on, on another supervisor, uh, I think we would be open to that. But w whether another supervisor would feel they knew enough about uh, an AI model, I mean, I, I, think, I think for the, the near term at least, uh, we will fall back on the tried and tested uh, things of getting the firm to explain to us how they have verified that the model works and, and, and is unbiased and, and learns in a, in a in a sensible way and, and, and so on, um, rather than us seeking to verify it ourselves. Um, but it, it's such a rapidly moving area and, and such an area where there are so many open questions that who knows where we'll be in a few years' time. We have time for one more question. Um, uh, this will be the last question of the conference. <laughs> Hi. Where, where am I looking? Oh. It's me. Oh, right. yes, sir. Thank you. So I'm Noor Ali Yahya with the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority. Uh, it's more than a question as to share our experience. Sure. Uh, we've been uh, regulating the insurance industry in Saudi Arabia, and in this uh, regard, we just published an insurance aggregator uh, rules where we regulate the aggregator uh, activities. So instead of having an aggregator as a third party or being outsourced, now we require to get a license from uh, the from SAMA, so they can practice, and we can make sure that we uh, listen to their uh, uh, um, wishes, as they would uh, require some uh, flexible requirement. However, we need to make sure that the uh, ensure the policyholder uh, information are protected, the uh, underwriting is doing in a good way, because at the end of the process, you will buy an insurance from the website. So we want to make sure that the cyber uh, requirements are all fully uh, 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 met, and uh, the policyholder benefit as protected, are protected, uh, yet we want to facilitate it more for the policyholders and the companies to uh, spread the products through the market. So uh, I think we've been looking around uh, the world that the, the closest ideal to it was the price comparison uh, companies, which, is, which doesn't go under the supervision of the insurance authorities. Uh, so now we are uh, proposing to have it uh, within the authority to make sure that all the activities are uh, respected. Well, that sounds amazing. So uh, thank you for your insight and, uh, and, and contribution. That's, that's great. Um, we need to wrap up, um, so I want to thank Claudia, to Bill, uh, to Hiroshi and Peter, but I actually want to say a special thanks to Hiroshi, who um, this is his last meeting as vice chair of the, yeah. the association, and perhaps this is your last official function uh, as an uh, IAS uh, vice chair and, yeah. uh, and, and supervisor. I know you're moving to another role within the, the, the Bank of Japan, so uh, Hiroshi, thank you so much for your contribution. and. Um, to Claudia, Bill and Peter, thank you also for this afternoon. Please join me in thanking our panel.